All right, hello everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Brian Welly. I'm in People Operations, and one of the teams that I lead is the People Innovation Lab, where we happen to know that social science is like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so it is my sincere pleasure to welcome Dolly Chug to Google Thank to you. talk about a fantastic book that she just wrote called How Good People Fight Bias, The Person You Mean to Be. Dolly is a social psychologist. She's a professor of management at NYU. And she is writing about things that so many of us at Google care desperately about and uh, articulates a journey that I feel like we as an organization are on today. Mm -hmm. So it is such a pleasure to have you here today. It is such an honor to be here. Thank you so much to everybody for coming, especially after a long weekend. Well, I have to start by uh, confessing something. Uh oh, I have been known to say, uh, after reviewing all, all of the unconscious bias literature, mm -hmm. helping to put together trainings and workshops and talking to Googlers about it, at the end of all of this, I often say, social scientists have been great at demonstrating that we have a problem. Yes. But they have been terrible at telling us how to fix it. Yes. And I thought that was true until I read your book. Oh. And you had done, <laughs> you have done such a wonderful job at piecing together narrative across yeah. lots of different studies and taking the results of those studies and translating them into practical advice for those of us who want to be better. So well, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you, Brian. I, I, I think part of my motivation to write this book was that I'm as confused as everyone else and trying to navigate the confusing space of trying to be as good a person as I want to be. And it occurred to me that there is some stuff in these dusty academic journals that no one reads um, that could be helpful. And my goal was a lot of the research isn't mine, but I thought I could curate it, throw mine in, add some fantastic stories and interviews, and bring it to life. Well, you definitely did do that. Thank you. Um, so I have so many questions. Oh my gosh. And we okay. had the chance to have lunch before, and, and poor Dolly, had, she's like, I, I need to go to the restroom. We didn't see her for a long <laughs> no, time, and I think she was just, just like getting a rest for my questions. So <laughs> here, here are some um, that I thought uh, our audience would like to hear the answers to. And by the way, we'll uh, have a Q&A for about 40 minutes, and then we will open up the mics to your questions as well. Um, so first, I want to start with something that is so central to your book mm -hmm. that if you don't get this concept and agree with it, it's like you shouldn't even read the rest of the book. That's not a good sales pitch at all. <laughs> That's a terrible sales pitch, Brian. Hopefully we can all be there, <laughs> but I, I, I thought we had to start there. <laughs> okay. And that is with the concept of bounded ethicality. Ah, yeah. So I'm going to quote something from your book. Okay. Founded ethicality is the psychology of goodish people. Mm -hmm. Goodish people are sometimes good and sometimes not sometimes intentionally and sometimes not, like all of us. This model of bounded ethicality challenges ways of thinking and talking in which you are either a good person or not, a racist or not, an unethical human or not. Yeah. We argue that this binary notion is seductive but misleading and scientifically inaccurate. So this seems obvious when it's spelled out this way, at least to me, but what does it mean to internalize like bounded ethicality for ourselves and why is it so hard to do so? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we've got a really tight corner that we put ourselves in when we think about who we want to be. Um, research shows that on a one to seven scale, most of us put the importance of thinking of ourselves as a good person above a six. It's really important to us, not like Mother Teresa good, but just having an identity where we think of ourselves as the kind of person that we would call a good person, it doesn't, your definition and your definition and your definition may be different of what a good person is, but whatever your own definition is, that is something that most of us hold dear to us. And we feel really threatened when there's anything that suggests we're not hitting that good person bar, some minimum threshold of like being a good person. Um, I know I feel that way. I got an email from a student uh, telling me that I had assigned a sexist reading to class. And it was a female student, and I am i consider myself a feminist. I have two daughters. I am trying hard to raise them as feminists. And to get an email like this feels very threatening. <laughs> like, this is, oh my god, you've totally threatened my good person bar, um, my good person identity. 
But the truth is, when I reread the reading, I was like, ooh, <laughs> that is a little like, wow, I, what is the whole thing about? Like, women just love to shop. Like, there, there was some stuff in that article that really should have caught my eye, but I had, I had my own blind spots, and it just went right by me. And the problem is, if as a good person, if I have to be in a super tight corner where there's no room for blind spots and no room for mistakes, I will not grow from that mistake. I will dismiss that email from that student. I will not learn from what she's helped me see. I will keep assigning that reading because I won't see the value in her critique. And as a result, my desire to be a good person is going to hold me back from being a better person. Our research on bounded ethicality, and when I say our research, I mean our field, like, like psychologists for the last 40 years, have shown in so many different ways that we do have blind spots, that we do have lapses, that we do make mistakes, and the, we do have unconscious bias. We, do, or we are prone to conflicts of interest outside of our awareness. And every one of those examples, the question is, for me, are we just going to deny that or are we going to grow from it? And so what I'm proposing is, given that the research on bounded ethicality is clear, let's break out of that corner, that super tight either or, either I'm a good person or I'm not corner, and give ourselves room to grow. And what that means is setting a higher standard. Being a goodish person instead of a good person is someone who doesn't necessarily make more mistakes, but they do acknowledge more mistakes, they do own more mix, mix, mistakes, and they do learn from more mistakes than someone who simply is in that tight, good person corner. Yeah, when I read this, uh, that portion of your book, it um, called to mind all the ways that we reinforce the binary and how we talk about other people. Like we'll talk mm. about uh, people as evil, or that's this person is such a great person, yeah. or this person's a criminal. It's almost like yeah. we've created the boundaries already. And then you exist within it. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't lend itself to a growth mindset, which you talk a lot about. Exactly. And that growth mindset is that work in progress mindset, as everyone here is familiar, that we're it, it, not either or good. We are always getting better no matter where our starting point is. And one of the things that I learned the most from in writing the book was the people I interviewed, some of whom are like icons, like... Joe McNeil of the Greensboro Four, 1960 Woolworths lunch counter sit-ins, like led the sit-in movement. Someone who's truly a civil rights giant speaking candidly about his efforts to have a growth mindset about gay rights. Like a really moving story to me that says this either or binary is gonna hold us back. We have to find the work in progress inside. Um, you use concepts in your books that were like seeing old friends to me because they're mm. concepts that are very important to us at Google yeah. and ones that we have been doing our own research on and, and have found to be internally important. So growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, which is this notion that um, uh, we all have things to learn. Uh, we can all grow. We can get better. We should yeah. be incorporating feedback is so important to how we try to engage with our work and with each other. There's another concept of psychological safety, and that is uh, creating environments where it's safe to express yourself, to admit mistakes, yeah. and to learn. Uh, we have done our own research on teamwork, and we found psychological safety is the number one predictor of whether teams are successful in their endeavors. Yes. Uh, what I loved uh, about your book is that you actually showed a pathway from growth mindset to psychological safety to uh, fighting bias. Can yes. you talk about those connections? Sure, and this is where I took the, li the liberties that you can't take within science, where in science we would have all been in a very narrow silo that, you know, Carol Dweck is the psychologist, her and her colleagues have done the work on growth mindset. Amy Edmondson is uh, the organizational behavior scholar with psychological safety, unconscious bias, Mazarin Banaji, and, and they're each doing really deep, deep work in those areas along with their labs and colleagues. But what that means is that connecting those doesn't happen within science. Those things sit separately within our journals. Um, and so what I tried to do was step outside of the science a little bit. I say in the beginning of the book, like, I'm going to step outside the science because I feel like we don't have time to wait 50 years before somebody is going to actually run the studies that connect all those things. I think we can use our common sense to see the connections. 
growth mindset on an individual level, seeing yourself as a work in progress, seeing someone, seeing yourself as someone who can grow from mistakes rather than when you hit an obstacle and make a mistake, you shut down, you cheat, you quit. That's what happens in a fixed mindset. Well, that's psychological safety is the same concept in a team. Do we shut down as a team? Do we not talk about mistakes? Do we not verbalize vulnerability? Or do we create a space where we can talk about, I think I messed that up. I think I dropped the ball. I'm really scared about what's coming next. That's growth mindset to me on a team level. And I think that then sets the stage for think topics like unconscious bias. Um, it's tough to, I think we've gotten to the point where we believe the science on unconscious bias, but it's still tough to believe that it might sometimes leak into our behavior, that we might sometimes enact harm. Um, and so that's where that psychological safety in a team where you can talk about it, growth mindset within the individual sets us up to do the work on unconscious bias. The, the thing that makes me saddest about the way the public dialogue has moved on unconscious bias is that we sometimes seem to be saying, well, because it's unconscious, I'm no longer accountable. Well, that's like saying, because I was drunk, I'm not accountable for the harm I did when I was behind the wheel. Absolutely, it's you are still accountable. The question is, how are we going to take ownership and learn from it, especially when as scientists, we have not cracked the code on how to debias our brains yet. So. In the meantime, we're gonna to have to use the growth mindset and psychological safety as our tools. That is definitely a theme I saw throughout the book, which is noticing. It's like yeah. the first step is just noticing. Noticing. And being aware. Exactly, being a first class noticer is a big part of it. And then starting to think about, if we can't debias the brain, how can we debias the process, the team, the system, the structures? Yeah, a story you were telling me earlier just stuck with me about, um, being willing to not just notice, but to acknowledge when we have, when each of us has had a stereotype thought or expressed unconscious bias yeah. and we made it conscious. And it had to do with your work with, uh, in prisons and people mm. who are incarcerated. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about what you're doing with prison population and how you felt when you first went oh, into sure. that environment and how that affected you? Yeah. So I've had this really wonderful opportunity to get involved with the NYU prison education program. And during the year I spent uh, working on this book, I had two priorities. Uh, I took a sabbatical to work with the prison education program and to write the book. And what that meant is I was teaching a four, co four college credit course, really similar to the one I teach MBA students at Stern on leadership, management, and negotiation skills. And I was going to do it in a prison um, in upstate New York. And... <laughs> What I realize now when I look back is that one of the traps I describe in the book that I was probably like writing that chapter while I was actually displaying the behavior was I talk about the savior trap, about having this vision of yourself as being a do-gooder who's going to save the day and have that feel good feeling, that, that warm glow that comes from saving someone else. And I... I can now see how that was motivating me into wanting to do the teaching in prison. But the problem with the savior trap is that it still kind of puts me like above, right? And it otherizes the people I'm engaging with. And I saw that in the first couple of classes when I was teaching that I was like super scared of my students. And I definitely had not view, was not viewing them as individuals but within a couple of classes, it was sort of weirdly normal to teach in a prison. Like they, my students were just like, and I know there's some alums in the room, but they were just like you guys. Um, so they, they were funny and they were quiet and they were serious and they were more prepared and they were less prepared. I mean, they, they had a whole range of personalities and they were just individuals who were super motivated to learn. Um, now, do I know that some of them did things uh, that created real harm for people that led to them being in prison? Some of them did. There's all sorts of injustices in the system as well. And is that confusing to me? And does it create all sorts of like, oh, my God, the long drives home from the prison were like real 
confusing mental uh, times for me. But what I realized by the third class was I had dehumanized my students. I came in thinking I'm going to teach a group of felons. I'm going to redeem them. And that in and of itself created this savior mentality where I was never going to be useful to them because I wasn't seeing them as human beings. And so it sort of clicked into place by class three that I had like a bunch of just individuals that I was going to interact with. And, and one of them had read 106 books the year before and showed me the list of his books. And the other one cried when we role played difficult conversations because he was thinking about his son and they were people. And, and now about three quarters of my students have been released from prison. And when I encounter them and interact with them in the city and they're in normal clothes, I truly realized that I had created this image, this uniformed image of an imprisoned person that was absent of any humanity. You're talking about uh, prisons in the criminal justice system actually uh, brings up another aspect of your book. Now, the first uh, portion of your book is about uh, taking social science and helping us understand how each of us can notice yeah. and change our behaviors and to relate to people and have a growth mindset. But there's another thread through your book, which is about systems. Yeah. And so sometimes the, uh, the biases that we encounter um, are a byproduct of systems that we've created. And you talk about this in terms of headwinds and tailwinds. Yeah. I'm wondering, can you tell, tell me what, what do those terms mean? And is there uh, any research that you can tell us uh, about that demonstrates how that happened? Sure, absolutely. So I stole the metaphor of headwinds and tailwinds from Debbie Irving. And she talks about forces like, OK, so imagine I'm like jogging <laughs> so slowly. But I do. But <laughs> really slow but but okay but on uh, if I'm jogging and I've got a good tailwind going I might improve my time from like it's usual 10 minute 30 second mile to like a 10 minute 15 second mile because I've got that tailwind pushing me along but I don't get a sense that I'm got a tailwind you don't even feel tailwinds really right you just feel like you're kind of rocking it that morning and you're just like I don't know it was maybe those those eggs I ate I don't know I'm just really like right but then when you turn or you'd make that run and then you do the u-turn to come back and now you've got the headwind and it you feel every bit of it and it does slow you down and your time shows it and your fatigue shows it and your motivation shows it that headwind is much more visible to us than the tailwind, much more feelable to us. And what a systems approach is about is what are the ways in which we create very visible um, uh, headwinds and less visible tailwinds? What are the ways those are built into how we operate? Um, so I, I when I sent this book proposal off uh, to publishers, I literally didn't have the word system in it. I didn't have system or systemic anywhere in the proposal. I thought this was going to be a book purely on the individual level about unconscious bias. And it was as I started talking to people and looking at the research that it became clear to me that even if I somehow like won the Nobel Prize and was the one who figured out how to de-bias unconscious bias, let's like, say that was my claim to fame, right? Wave the magic wand, I still would not have solved the problem because our systems would still have so much bias built in. The way we were, um, for example, I used to work in professional services firms like investment banking and consulting. And when we would interview, a big part of the way we would interview would be we would look for fit, cultural fit. Like, oh, is this the person we've, the classic, do you want to um, go on a long plane ride sitting next to them? Would you want to be sitting next to them on a flight to Asia? Cultural fit. And I was part of that system. I interviewed people using those criteria. But now when I look back and I understand better what how systems work, I realized I created a huge headwind for people who didn't go to the same alma mater as me, who didn't have the same hobbies as me, because those were the kinds of questions that like were the fit conversation. Could we banter about common interests? And in fact, Lauren Rivera, a sociologist, did an in-depth ethnography where she looked at hiring practices at elite firms. And that's exactly what she found, was that what we call fit, that's meant to capture 
performance aspects of a job was in fact capturing things like passion hobbies and shared academic backgrounds, things that weren't necessarily tied directly to the job. That's an example of a headwind where we're, there's a, people from a whole bunch of schools who could do the job who aren't gonna get a chance at it. There's people who have varied interests, who have varied cultural backgrounds, who have varied family backgrounds, who aren't gonna fit the mold of the kind of banter that we would do in interviews. And, um, and people like me, benefit from that tailwind because I did go to those schools and I do kind of have those hobbies. I mean, I can talk about marathon running. I just don't say my time. <laughs> I thought it was very interesting that you and your collaborator, Katie Milkman, yeah. sort of, um, took these notions and applied it to your own academic community, oh, which yeah. I think in the, uh, many universities would like to believe that they are probably the most egalitarian uh, institutions you can yeah. be a part of. Um, but you did a study that showed otherwise. Right. Uh, Katie Milkman, who's at Wharton, and Madupe Akinola, uh, who's at Columbia Business School, the three of us went to grad school together. And a really common practice before you apply to a PhD program is uh, when I say really common, really common if you're on the inside and someone tells you to do this, so it's not so common is to email faculty at the PhD program you're interested in and signal that you're interested and ask if they'd be willing to tell you about their research. And you do all this before you send your application in. So it's totally outside the official formal process. And um, all three of us as grad students had been advised to do that by people in our network. And we did that and we did get into grad school and we did get great mentors and everything worked out happily ever after for us. But we were wondering what happens to people who aren't as networked as us or maybe people who do get this advice but um, don't quite match the profile that unconsciously maybe faculty, despite their egalitarian names, might be looking for. So, we did something kind of sneaky. It was a sting operation, which as social scientists we call an audit study or a field experiment. And I know, I know at Google you are very familiar with field experiments. So what we did was we created email addresses using people's names. We pre-tested these names to either be male sounding or female sounding. Please forgive the gender binary. Um, and then white sounding, black sounding, Hispanic sounding, Chinese sounding, or Indian sounding. So those were five racial ethnic identities, two gender identities. We crossed them. We have 10 identities now. We created multiple names for each identity. So we don't have any sort of particular name effect for an identity. And then we created an email address for every one of those fictional students. We took the US News and World Report rankings of the top 260 schools. For every PhD granting department in those schools, we randomly pick the name of one professor. And remember, it's as um, in academia, all our information is on the internet. We're really easy to find slash stalk. And, and so, um, so it was really easy to do this. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of work, but it was, it was simple. Um, so now we've got our fictional students and we've got one professor from every PhD granting department. And what we did was we said, one, every professor received one email from one of those identities. And our dependent variable was, would the professor write back to a cold call email from a stranger saying they were interested in learning more about this PhD program? There's a little more nuance that I'm gonna skip, but if you're ever interested, we've got some papers that get into the details. But if I, if I cut to the chase, um, we were comparing with the white male identity to all those not white male identities and uh, the students. And what we found was that if you were a white male student, you, were, um, you had about an 87% chance of getting a response to your email. And if you were not a white male student, you had a 62% chance of getting a response to your email. And this is identical emails being sent at an identical time with an identical request. And so even in our world of academia, where we, you know, if anything, we're stereotyped as being, you know, how we're stereotyped, like being sort of bleeding heart uh, liberals, um, we were seeing what I have to assume was mostly unconscious bias. It, there very well is probably some conscious in there as well, but I think there was at least some unconscious bias at work. Sobering. Yeah. Um, I'd like to shift focus to work organizations. Yeah. You happen to be sitting in one. Yeah. And ask you for some advice here. 
Um, uh, you devote a portion of your writing to what happens within organizations, and for good reason, because we spend much of our lives here, and a lot of what we uh, get, uh, money, status, authority, comes to work. Yes. So first of all, um, I found your, your definition of diversity and inclusion mm. very interesting. So you define each of them differently. Uh, let's start with how you view diversity and how you view inclusion. Yes, thanks. Um, and these words are often bundled together, diversity, inclusion, D and I. Sometimes you throw in a B for belonging, right? But, but they actually do mean different things. And if we're really to measure success, we're going to need to know what we mean. Um, the metaphor I've been using for diversity is I think of it as the gateway, the, the getting of the job, the getting into the school, the getting on the team, the getting the promotion. So it's, it's a formal process. It's got, it's often got some legal um, kind of guidance over what appropriate process is. It is relatively easy to measure. And it sets someone up to get through the entry point, the gateway. Inclusion, I think of as the pathway. And the pathway is what leads up to that gateway and what comes after that gateway, what comes before and what comes after. So this, this study I just described, the audit study, is an example of a pathway study, right? It was not the formal application process into the PhD program. It was this informal, if you were in the know, you sent the email and kind of started this little banter with a professor. Um, that is very much a pathway process. And pathway processes we don't measure. They're hard to measure. They can be as fluid as who interrupts who at a meeting, who goes to drinks with who, who gives eye contact to who, who sits next to who. These are the everyday moments that can have a real influence on how people um, experience an organization, but we're not as equipped to measure them as we go. And that falls into the inclusion yeah. side. So if you think about inclusion this way, there are hundreds of these moments right. that occur every single day. Right. You devote a portion of your book on meetings, which mm -hmm. I found fascinating. So yeah. if I work an eight hour day, yes. it feels like I spend 10 hours a day. <laughs> so that's, I think, the culture <laughs> that we have here at Google. But you gave some tangible, uh, uh, you're very optimistic say, uh, throughout your book, which made it a pleasure to read. Um, uh, but I think that the uh, title of this section of your book was um, Meetings Present Opportunities. Like that. <laughs> that was great. So um, if you think about meetings as opportunities yes. to be inclusive um, and to check your unconscious bias, what are, the, what are the tangible pieces of advice you would have for all of us who are spending our days? Yeah, meetings? absolutely. Thank you um, for, for letting me share that. The uh, the Oktoberfest conference room that we were in before we walked in here, I noticed had a run inclusive meetings placard up there, which was fascinating. And it mirrored some of the ideas in the book. So Tony Prophet is the chief equality officer at salesforce.com. And I interviewed him for the book. And, you know, when you have a title like chief equality officer, I thought, okay, let's find out what the chief equality officer recommends. And I'm expecting some really like big plans. And I'm sure Tony has big plans. I'm not in any way um, suggesting he doesn't. But what, what struck me is what his first answer was to my question of what do you think is most important? He said, run better meetings. I'm like, run better meetings? I mean, everyone knows meetings suck. Like, what, <laughs> that's just like sort of like part of organizational life. Um, and he said, no. He said, your meetings mirror your organization. Whatever the headwinds and tailwinds are in your organization are happening in your meetings. But your meetings are a little easier to like, you can get a grip on that. You can start somewhere. You can think about who should be in the room and who isn't in the room who should be. You can think about, are we balancing airtime? I mean, that's like a measurable thing. You can think about, uh, did we interrupt people or not? You can think about, uh, did we create an environment in which people disagreed with each other or did we have a meeting, which I, I use when I, when I teach about meetings to my students um, in our managerial skills class, I call it the most precious real estate. 
that we treat meetings like it was it's some little piece of desert land in a in a in an area that nobody wants that land that they're they're, they're paying you to take that land that's how we treat meetings we just throw them together not here i mean like in other companies um, <laughs> but but the truth is meetings are like fifth avenue real estate you getting multiple people in the room at the same time thinking about the same thing that's fifth avenue real estate and that's how we should treat it. That's the end. You wouldn't just throw any old thing on Fifth Avenue, right? You would really put a lot of thought into designing it. And that's, in fact, what we do want to do in meetings is put that level of thought into it. And if you're going to put that level of thought into it, and if you're going to use that level of precious real estate, what is the point of having a meeting where everyone agrees with each other? Like, did you actually need the meeting for everyone to agree with each other? Or could you have just agreed to agree and not have the meeting. So if you're not running a meeting where there's room for disagreement, then the question is, why did you have the meeting? Some of the benefits of diversity and inclusion are a range of perspectives, are a range of opinions. Is this a meeting where you can actually do that? One of the dynamics um, that we know can happen in meetings is that uh, people who you would not expect to have a legitimate point of view on any particular topic mm. are marginalized. Yeah. And so you can have wonderful things being expressed that are simply not heard. And uh, in the book, you talk about your dissertation research, which actually mm -hmm. uh, demonstrated in a really profound way, I thought, with some like actual statistics behind it. Can you tell us yeah. what was that research and what did you find? Yeah, that, that takes us back. Um, so in my dissertation, here's what I did. I, I asked people to like be in a game show, but it wasn't really a game show. It was just me and my laptop walking around South Station in Boston asking strangers to play this game with me. And <laughs> there were different times. You could do that. Um, so, so the game I would ask them to play is I would say, hey, um, I'm going to show you photographs, and I want you to guess uh, how many jelly beans are in the jar, or how much this huge piece of machinery weighs, like questions that would be kind of hard to know the answer to without some special knowledge. And I'm going to pay you for how well you guess. The closer you get, the better you do. But it's going to be like, I forget which game show, is it Hollywood Squares that does this, where you, uh, you first get to guess, and then you get to listen to someone else's point of view, and then you get to revise your guess. So the question is, do you use the advice that someone else gives you or not? And um, the thing I varied, the questions were the same for everybody, but the thing I varied is whose advice they heard. And they, they would just listen to it in little headphones. And so the advice might be someone um, with a Hispanic accent. It might be someone with a white sounding, I realize those are not mutually exclusive, but white sounding accent. It might be someone who sounds African American, male, female, like just had a bunch of different voices. And um, of course I rigged the whole thing so that all the advice was 100% correct, right? So everybody heard the correct answers. And it was just a matter of you know whether you trusted the advice from this unknown voice. And what I found was, I called it a stereotype tax, that the people, for example, who had a female advisor in their ear were less likely to take that advice. I think they made 69, 69 cents on the dollar for people who had a male advisor because they were so much less likely to take the advice of the female advisor. And I, you know, I tried to standardize a whole bunch of things like the tone of the voice and like everything that would sort of make something sound different other than just the gender. Um, and so my dissertation, the, the idea there was to show even in these really fluid moments, like in meetings, for example, when somebody throws an idea out and we have to make that split second of do we keep going with that or do we, you know, move on? Those little quick moments, we are potentially discounting points of view. Yeah, and I know it can be difficult to counteract that. If there were an easy solution, we would implement it right now, and yep. all meetings would be amazing if yep. we would take uh, all points of view into account that were good points of view. Um, <laughs> maybe I demonstrated some problematic thinking right there. Um, uh, but it, it, uh, in your book, you are prescriptive about things that we can do. One of the things mm. um, uh, that I noted was for if you walk into a setting and you have ordinary privilege, you yeah. are walking in with a stereotype that operates on your behalf, and you are a person with a growth mindset, yeah. someone who is on the journey uh, to being a better person. 
and you hear ideas, using your ordinary privilege to stand up uh, for someone else's idea was one way of Exactly. Doing uh, yeah, any, amplifying. Yeah, any, any other tangible advi advice to help us uh, really hear um, good ideas? Yeah, I mean, I also sometimes do the thought experiment in my head of, of when I'm, I can feel myself dismissing someone, I imagine it, the same idea coming out of someone else, like, you know, I'm not going to say who, but right now I'm picturing two colleagues in my mind, in my in my work world. And like, if I take the idea out of one person's mouth and I put it in another, do, would I be listening more carefully or would I be tuning out in the meeting right now? And, and the truth is, with the two people I have in mind, I might be tuning out uh, less if it was coming from someone else. And so I think we're, while it's hard to de-bias the brain, it isn't so hard to do the noticing, to actually just kind of put yourself in that counterfactual of what if. Um, I'm going to ask you another question, but I will mm -hmm. take audience questions in just a minute. So if you have one, there are two mics, um, and please make your way up there and you can ask your question. Um, so uh, what you've described in your book is a process that we can all go through. And many people are, are engaged in that journey, but many are not. And uh, based on some research that you had reviewed, you sort of summed up three kinds of people, the 20, mm. 60, 20s. You've got the easy 20s. These are people who are intrinsically motivated to be unbiased. They are really working and you know you can talk to them yeah. and you'll have a uh, kindred spirit. Um, then you've got sort of this middle 60 who's really nowhere. Like they're silent, yeah. um, they're not really paying attention and these issues just have not surfaced for them yet. Right. And then you've got the stuck 20. Mm. This is a 20% of people who are um, really set and entrenched in their ideas. Uh, they are not willing to listen or to change. And I think we all probably have some people like that in our lives. Mm. The thing that struck me about that is um, your advice for the stuck 20 is you can choose to engage or not engage with them. Um, it's important to make your points of view known, but don't expect necessarily that they're going to change along the way. It's sort of a, an agreement that you come to with yourself and with them. In a workplace, that's problematic mm -hmm. because let's presume that a portion of those 20% are working here with us. Yeah. We are in an organization that is trying very hard to have bias-free systems and processes to hold ourselves up to higher standards to make sure we all have growth mindsets. Um, what advice do you have for organizations that have portions of these 20% in there um, and we want them to thrive and add value, but we also need them to be operating in a way that is living up to the cultural standard we're trying to set. Yeah, absolutely. So the 20-60-20 rule um, can be applied to anything. It's not specific to bias. In fact, I learned it from um, organizational change consultant Susan Anunzio, uh, who I used to work with. I, academia is a second career. Uh, consulting, banking was first career. And when I worked with her, she would use this as an approach to any cultural change in an organization. And um, the the, the 20 what it does is not say that we have to forget about the 20, uh, the stuck 20, but it does say to be really careful of how you use your energy there. Because the stuck 20 tends to be vocal and the middle 60 tends to be quiet. And so what we can easily have happen is that all of our energy and focus goes to the stuck 20 and you find yourself in those arguments that nobody's listening to, but you're doubling down and they're doubling down. And the middle 60 is tuning out because this has gotten pretty boring. Um, and you've missed the opportunity to, to either engage with the stuck 20 knowing you have a hidden audience in the middle 60 so if you're going to engage here, at least know the middle 60 is listening or could be listening if you could be engaging. So rather than it being a, you're trying to convince this person, think of it as I'm trying to actually shape a larger group's perspective. And in doing that, you are going to shift norms, right? So when you move the middle 60, which could go this way or could go this way, you're shaping the norms and those norms are going to do the work on your step 20. Norms are incredibly power, powerful um, shapers of behavior. And so you may not be able to convince the stuck 20, but you are able to shape norms and influence the views of people around you. And that will do the work. That's a powerful lever. I found it um, 
uh, amazing to, to read about how you um, interact over social media with people who have yeah. very contrarian points of view. And you write that uh, you will engage with them knowing that the 60% right. are reading. So you're really engaging them for the 60% and not with any expectation of changing the person you're actually. Exactly. Writing. So I don't, I don't, I know when I'm not going to get anywhere in one of those social media things that we all find ourselves in. Um, but what I do do is speak to the lurkers because I know, because I lurk too, I know there's a whole bunch of people lurking and like waiting for the, the fight to begin. And instead of like going into the fight, now that I've got their attention, I just use it as an opportunity to speak. And sometimes I literally just speak past the person arguing with me. Like, I mean, I'm respectful. I'm always respectful, but I don't even worry about like getting into what they're saying. I just say what I wish the middle 60 knew and use it as that, that moment now that I've got the sort of the fight, uh, their attention on the fight. There was a powerful moment uh, in your interview with Joe McNeil. Yeah. And you had asked him whether, in hindsight, he would have done anything differently when he was sitting at that counter at Woolworths. Yeah, exactly. Joe McNeil, Greensboro 4, who we talked about earlier, he said, first I asked him, um, would you have done anything differently? He, looking back, he's in his mid-70s now. And at first he's like, no, I think, I think we did it right, you know? And then he kind of took a sip of his coffee and then he said, you know, you know what I would have done? I would have spoken more to the people who were silent. Basically, he was saying the middle 60. I would have given them a chance to be a better person, too. That's what I would have done. And I just thought that was such a powerful insight uh, from somebody who was really on the front lines, risking everything, his life, everything. Um, any questions from any of you? All right, I've got more. Good. Um, so uh, the growth mindset that you describe in the book uh, will lead us to ask a lot more questions than we're probably asking today. Um, it will lead us to take seriously the things that people tell us that we may have dismissed, our old self may have dismissed, but the new self is actually uh, reflecting on it, yeah. seeing if there's some truth to it. Um, in the process of having this growth mindset and being on this journey, you're asking the people who may be most disadvantaged, most marginalized, yeah. um, the ones who are the negative recipients of the unconscious bias right. to do a lot of educating and engaging. Right. Is that fair? I don't want to put that burden of education. Um, so this is where those of us who have ordinary privilege, ordinary privilege is the piece of your identity you think least about. We all have multiple facets to our identity. I'm straight. I can go weeks and months without thinking about the fact that I'm straight. It, it's the, the world is set up for me, right? I, someone asked what I did this weekend. It's easy to just share my, my husband and I did this or whatever. I can put pictures of my family and I don't worry about being uh, uh, penalized in some conscious or unconscious way at work. Ordinary privilege is a piece of your identity you think least about because that's where you have the tailwinds. And that's also where you have surprising influence. And so studies show that let's say a black person says something about a racist joke versus a white person saying something about the same racist joke. The black person is perceived as being whiny, whereas the white person will have more influence than they expect they're going to have in that moment. And there's been multiple studies that have basically shown that same pattern, that in the piece of your identity where you have ordinary privilege, you also, what ordinary privilege brings is unexpected influence. And so this is where we, where so many of us feel helpless right now, we actually have reason to be optimistic that we have more influence than we realize, not to speak over or for someone else, but to take some ownership so that the same people aren't doing the same work, educating others time and time again. The other thing I really liked is I interviewed Suba Berry, who's held a number of senior roles in financial services and is now, I think, the president of Working Mother Media. And she's kind of been fighting a bunch of fights for decades, trying to 
create more uh, equity and equality in organizations. And I asked her how she sustains herself in that. And she described flipping channels on the TV once and running across this National Geographic special about birds. And it was all about the V formation that some birds fly in. Have you ever noticed that? And what she didn't know, and I didn't know until she told me, is that when you see that V formation in the sky, and it looks like it's just static, the same birds, that what's actually happening is the lead bird rotates to the back, that there's this constant rotation. And that's because the lead bird is the one who's taking the headwinds, right? Time, that's the hardest job, to break the wind up front. And it's the most exhausting. So the way the birds are able to sustain this is by not always having the same lead bird. And I think that's another piece of this is when in the areas in which we have ordinary privilege, how can we step into that lead bird role? Again, not speaking over or for people, but taking some ownership for trying to create the kind of environment, culture, workplace that we value. Oh, hi, hi. Professor. <gasps> hey. <laughs> Um, so in your amazing class at Stern, um, you taught us that there were a lot of different types of cultures that could be successful, um, but building off the conversation about bias and hiring practices, how do you um, have a hiring practice that gets the right person for culture without sort of culture fit being synonymous for some sort of implicit bias in that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a matter of thinking about where... Um, what it is about that cultural fit that's going to enhance performance and actually getting into what the behavioral indicators are. So if if what what's needed is that we need to be able to spend long periods of time together without driving each other crazy, we can do that without necessarily having to have gone to the same cluster of colleges. It's more a matter of maybe what you do in your, um, your interviewing or hiring process is you actually screen for what is it like to spend time with this person or how do they react under stress as opposed to relying on the more informal banter that makes assumptions that just because we went to the same schools, we would have the same comfort level. And and, if, and I realize it's not that explicit. You know, the processes I was part of in advance, we were never that explicit that that's what we, we were looking for, the same schools. But that is sort of what we ended up doing. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Hey. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming here and having this conversation. Thank you um, for having me. Uh, I was wondering what your advice is for, like, when you make a mistake, particularly in the workplace, like, how, how do you recover from that? How do you make sure you've, uh, like, repaired the harm that you've done and, and like, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's like in all other parts of our life, it, it, when we have some sort of faux pas or error that creates negative impact on others, the ways in which we know taking accountability works here too. So, um, you know, we'll use an example. It's not, I'm sorry you were offended by that, right? The, it's, I'm sorry that I did harm. I'm sorry for my error in judgment. I'm sorry for my ignorance. And then where you can go with that is you can ask if the other person is interested in educating you about the harm you've done, but you don't expect them to do it because that is putting labor on the other person to then go through, not only has harm been done, now it's my job to educate you about your blind spots and deal with all your emotional reactions and not offending you and all that sort of stuff. So I, I think it's first the apology, There's an, you can make an invitation if the person's into it, great. If they're not, it's your job to go figure out how to educate yourself. Thank you. Thank you. That, uh, in, in your book, you write a bit about um, uh, events that, traumatic events that have been happening in the United States, whether it's the shooting in Orlando yeah. at a gay nightclub or um, uh, the police shootings that have happened. And we know people who are members of the communities that would have been affected. And you profiled uh, different people and how they've processed that yeah. or how they've provided support. Um, what is a, a lesson that you learned from them yeah. that you would uh, pass on to us? Oh, my gosh. So psychologists call this hidden grief, that at any given moment, including now, one out of four of us is sitting here in this room with real hidden grief whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's a traumatic event in your life, whether it's something happening in the news that feels very personal to you, that there is something 
there's a lot of work you're doing just to hold it together at any given moment. And in what I read about and learned about with hidden grief and thinking about it in the context of national events and international events and how they affect for example, my students. So, you know, I teach at NYU. I deal with students um, on, not on a daily basis, but like on, on a flowing basis where I see them over the, 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 the um, stretch of an entire semester and things happen in the world during that time. And it used to be that I kind of just, if I didn't know what to say, I'd say nothing. And I have to confess that there's still a portion of times when that's exactly what happens. But I think what I learned from the hidden grief research was just the noticing that someone's grief is there and the acknowledging that you see it, the bearing witness of it, not inserting myself, not making myself the savior, not cookie seeking, meaning uh, cookie seeking is like looking for their validation of how awesome it was that I checked in on them. Um, but just saying, hey, how are you holding up? And that's actually a phrase that I learned from one of my former students, the how are you holding up? It allows the other person to go in any number of directions. They can say, oh my God, I'm falling apart. I need to tell you everything. Or they can be like, oh, you know, good. Everything's great. You know, like they, they can use that question to go as deep or as lightly as they want, but they know that they're seen. And so I think um, the hidden grief piece is one of the places where I'm trying to do the most work of figuring out how to not allow silence to look like indifference to others. And that is how it's often perceived in the workplace. Go there. Hi. Hi there. First of all, I wanted to say, Brian, thank you so much. You ran the unbiasing video. I'm a noogler. So I saw an hour and a half of unbiasing training, and now I'm having a little Google crush. You're doing a great job. Oh, oh, so so thank you for putting together these programs. Um, I'm definitely part of the 20, <laughs> the 20 percent here in part because I want to be a better person and I want to be a better coworker. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a sociologist, so I'm constantly thinking about the group and the systematic biases. And I think being at Google has really challenged me to see where I fit at the individual level and really like what's going on there. And you said, ah, you know, changing the unconscious biases in our brain is really hard. Um, and then you kind of move on. <laughs> and I want to open that up a little mm. bit. What is it that I could do or anybody could do to really push ourselves to find the blind spots? Because naturally yeah. our brain doesn't want to find them. Um, how do we push ourselves to become more comfortable with these truths that maybe we didn't want to acknowledge before? What, you know, are there exercises? Are there great podcasts? I mean, where would we start to unpack? Well, there might be, I don't know. There might be, so yeah. any thoughts there would be great. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so it, it, you may have already done this, but I'll just throw out ideas for, for everyone. So there's the implicit association test, which is called the IAT. It, it, would they have yep. done that through the training? Possibly. Okay. I mentioned so. So implicit.harvard.edu is the site where you can find it. Um, you can do it completely anonymously. It's about a 10-minute test on the internet. It is not a perfect test. It is it is uh, an in-progress scientific method that we are trying to improve, we meaning we the field. Um, but it will give you a sense of where your blind spots are. You can pick different topics. There's at least 20 tests up there, race, gender, skin tone, physical ability. It goes on and on, sexual orientation, religion. Um, so that's one place to start. The second thing you can do, there's a great story in the book about Rick Clow, who some of you may know at Google Ventures, um, who I met at the same conference I met you at, Brian, right. at the Rework conference yep. a few years ago. I uh, say, though, when you wrote in the book that... Uh, there was that moment of awkwardness where yeah. you were trying to get your taxi back. It, <laughs> it made me feel bad. It made you feel bad? I was like, Dolly, I'm so glad you didn't get your taxi oh, to go back to the airport. So I was just back. saying, like, they had the open <laughs> dinner for the conference. And you know when you arrive at something and, like, there's going to be that networking thing. And you get there and, like, for there's that moment where you have nobody to talk to and you're just standing there. And I just, like, wanted to run and get my taxi back. Um, and I could still see it, like, sort of out of the corner of my eye. And then Rick Clow <laughs> saved the day um, and said, hi, I'm Rick. So, um, so I ended up having what would have been a small talky conversation at the entrance of what was a fantastic conference in every way um, with Rick Clow. And one of the things he talked about was after 
he took the IAT, he got a gender result that he wasn't happy with and didn't match his perception of himself um, as, I'm putting this in quotes because he cringes every time I say it, but like as one of the good guys, meaning someone who hires women, promotes women, um, creates opportunities for underrepresented groups. He really saw himself as the person who didn't need the unconscious bias training, who didn't need to take the IAT. And then when he got the result, he was taken aback and he thought, well, huh, I don't know. I don't think that's true. And so he decided to start, he's very active on social media. And I think in his particular role at Google Venture, social media is a really important part of the platform and influence he has. So he's like, eh, I don't know what they're talking about. And he starts like going through and like running some algorithms on who he follows on LinkedIn, on Twitter, who he retweets, who he's connected with, things like that. And he kept getting that he was, uh, his, his network was 80% male. And this was not what he expected at all. And it was consistent across all the platforms. Then he started noticing on his calendar that he'd been sitting on all um, male panels. Again, an important place where his voice and platform have influence. And so he realized through this little self audit he did, and so that would be the second thing I would suggest, is a self audit. In his case, he felt like these net, this network was an important place for you. It might be who are the last 10 people you had coffee chats with to network about. I'm sure you all have friends who want to work at Google. You know, Who are the people that you're having those informal conversations with? If you're a big movie person or or um, book person, what are the last 10 books or, or movies you consumed? How different were the voices and experiences in those books and movies from your own versus how similar were they to each other? Um, what associations are you, we're not just dealing with our implicit associations that we've built over our lives until now, we're creating new ones right now. Which ones are you creating right now? Those are things we can actively change. You can change who's in your network. You can change what you're consuming, what you're feeding your brain with. Um, I think that's like, those are immediate steps we can take where we don't have to do the, the bigger work of systemic change. Thank you for your question. All right, uh, we're coming at the end of time. Uh, Dolly, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, as um, our Noogler mentioned, we have an unconscious bias curriculum. All new hires are invited to watch this video to learn about it, and uh, we'll get emails every single week after the video goes out. And the most common email is, I want to learn more, and I want to know what I can do. And from this point forward, I'm going to say, Aww. read your book, because there's Aww. a lot of practical advice there. So thank you for sharing It was such a crush wisdom. on you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, thank Ryan. You. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.